From this point on until the closing song, your bulletin is absolutely useless for you. I don't know where my head was when I gave Robin my scripture title and my text, but I gave her what you see printed in your bulletin, and I have changed my mind since then. If you understand the church year and the church calendar, last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday, when we celebrate the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Today is Trinity Sunday. And since I have not preached on the Trinity for some period of time, I decided that we needed to hear what God tells us about the Trinity. And so our scripture lesson today is found in John chapter 6, It's not too far from Acts. If you have already found your way to Acts, go back a few pages to John chapter 6, and we will begin reading with verse 25, and we will read through verse 40. I don't do this very often where I depart from what I've given Robin, but it was just compelling to me to do that, and so uh, I did. John chapter 6 and beginning with verse 25. When they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you are looking for me not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, what must we do, what must we do to do the work God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none that he has given me, but raise them up at that last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. I will raise him up at that last day. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. Sue is going to give me some technical assistance, and I'm also going to do something else I've never done today. And that is, I'm going to preach to you using a PowerPoint. Don't get used to it, because it won't happen very often, if ever again. But this is a... There we go. Can I just push the button myself? Hoo-hoo! Okay, thank you. This is a picture... Yeah, I think this has a laser too, doesn't it? Oh, cool. Look at that. This is a picture. Today is Trinity Sunday, and I want to talk to you about the Trinity. And one of the important issues I want to bring to you about the Trinity today is that the concept of the Trinitarian understanding of God is under attack. There are many in our world who say, yes, we believe in God, but we do not believe that God's Son is God. Or we do not believe that the Holy Spirit is equal to God. Or they say we do not believe that the Son is equal to God. He might be God's Son, but he is not equal to God because he subordinates himself. And I would agree the fact that Jesus willingly subordinates himself to the the will of the Heavenly Father, but that does not make him any less. 
But I would share with you that Isaac subordinates himself to Abraham. When Abraham takes Isaac up onto Mount Moriah, whatever age Isaac is, and some say he's 12 at his bar mitzvah age, and some say he's as much as 30, which is when a priest can begin his public ministry, we need to understand that Abraham was 100 years older than Isaac. The only way that Isaac is going to be bound for the sacrifice is if he subordinates himself to the will of his father. And Jesus does that as well. What you see here is a a diagram that's not original with me. I borrowed it from somebody. It exists throughout history. I don't know who the author of this is. It's written to you mostly in Latin because that was the language of the church for many hundreds of years. And what it tells us up in the upper left-hand corner, it says the word pater, that means father. The upper right-hand corner, phileus, that means son. And down in the lower middle, it says spiritus sanctus, the Holy Spirit. You will see going from left, pater, to phileus, the word non est. It means is not. And you'll see in the very center the word deus. That means God. And you'll see from each of those points on that triangle that there is a path that leads to that center, and it is the word S. And so what we have, and I'll see if I can't use this laser and stand out of your way while we do it, is that the Father is not the same as the Son. The Son is not the same as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the same as the Father. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. The word Trinity does not appear in Scripture. I will be the first to tell you that. And some people say, well, how can you believe in something that doesn't appear in Scripture? There are lots of things that do not appear in Scripture that we hold to be true and that we understand. Simply because it doesn't that word does not appear in Scripture doesn't mean that the concept is not there for us in Scripture. The word Easter does not appear in Scripture. We all know what Easter is. It's the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is that wonderful, great day of resurrection. The word Easter does not appear in Scripture, except in the King James, and then it's used only one time. But it simply is not a biblical word for us. So Trinity should not bother us in the fact that it does not appear, that word does not appear in Scripture itself. In Trinity we have unity. By the unity of God we understand that there is but one God in the universe who exists as an infinite, eternal, and self-existent being. God has no beginning and no end. We see many times in Scripture, for instance, in the book of Revelation, where it says, who was and is and is to come. There is no beginning and ending for God. You and I are finite creatures. We have a beginning and an end. You know, I did a funeral yesterday. I have another one to do today. I have one to do on Tuesday. For those individuals, there is a beginning moment and there is an ending moment. For God, there is no beginning or end. He is infinite. He is eternal. He has no uh, problem understanding all periods of time and any given moment in time. He is God. He is able to do all of those things. He is infinite. He is eternal. And he is self-existent. He does not need us. We need him. He creates us to be like him, to be created in his image, but he doesn't need us. He does not need anything. He is self-existent. This truth is asserted or implied in the whole council of Scripture. We see many times that God is self-sufficient, that he is eternal, that he is all of those things that we have just talked about. In the Old Testament, the Israelite confessed his Faith by reciting the Shema in Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Unity in God. 
The first and fundamental command is expressed in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. To this was added the further admonition, acknowledge and take into heart this day that the Lord is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is no other. It's easy for you and I to make gods of almost anything. It's something that we desire, something that we worship, something that we set aside a time for, all of those kinds of things. And it's easy to make something God other than God himself. The Jews were set apart as people who had one God. And they worshiped this one God. And it is from this that we come as Christian beings. Oops, shouldn't have done that. Ooh, there we go. Um. We should understand that we have this Jewish tradition, these Jewish roots to us. Jesus is a Jew who has come to be the Messiah, the Savior, the one who gives life to us, the one who is the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He comes to be that Son. We just read there in John chapter 6 the story of Jesus who says to the Jews, You say that you ate manna in heaven. I tell you that this did not come from Moses. It came from God. And they said, it is the bread from heaven. And he says, I am the bread of life. This is a shocking statement to them. When Jesus equates himself to being God, he is God. They were not yet ready, perhaps, for this understanding. They should have been but they were not yet ready for this understanding as to who God is and that God has made himself known in the person of the Son. The other amusing thing, and we should have read that whole chapter of John chapter 6, but it's a bit laborious for us to do that, is the feeding of the 5,000 takes place before. And so when Jesus starts talking to them, they said, what miraculous sign will you give? Hello? Haven't you just eaten the bread and the and the fish? Haven't you just seen 5,000 people being fed with a few loaves and a few fish? You're asking for a sign? Pay attention. Look about. See what you're seeing there. God is identifying himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus performs miracles so that we can understand who he is. It removes all doubt for us as to who he is. Several New Testament passages also express the unity of God. We see that in Mark 12 and John 17, 1 Corinthians 8, Galatians 3.20. Even though we have one God who is eternally existent in three persons, there is unity. We never have the situation, and this is a common Christian misunderstanding, where God at one point in time in history was the Father. And God at another point in time in history is the Son. And God at a different point in time in history is the Holy Spirit. He is always Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at any given moment. And we see that evidenced in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Remember Jesus' baptism. When he goes into the water, first of all, John doesn't want to, but John finally relents and agrees. And we see that when Jesus is put down into that water and raised up again, that the Spirit of God descends upon him like a dove, and the voice from heaven speaks, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We see the manifestation of the Trinity in that example. We see also in Jesus, some of Jesus' final words, where he gives the great commission statement at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Go into all the world teaching people and baptizing them in the name of who? The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. This concept of the Trinity is not a foreign concept for us. It is difficult for us to understand. How can we understand one God who has eternally existed in three persons? We do not worship three gods. We worship one God. The human mind cannot comprehend the complexities of who God is. Aren't you glad? 
If I could understand who God is, if you could understand who God is, we'd have that mastered, wouldn't we? He's always there for us. We're always able to grasp perhaps a little bit more of that, but it's an infinite deep well of source and knowledge and and all of those kinds of things, and we never completely are able to understand who God is, and yet he's very knowable all at the same moment. Isn't that an amazing thing for you? It certainly is for me. The Trinity of God. In the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, one power, and one eternity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes we have tried to understand the Trinity by categorizing who God the Father is, categorizing who Jesus is, categorizing who the Holy Spirit is. And when we do that, we are wrong. We say God the Father is the creator. And Jesus Christ is the Savior. And that the Holy Spirit is the comforter. Jesus says, I'm the one who has given life to all of creation. Not the Father. It is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We need to also understand that when Jesus is born, this is not something new. He has been the Son from eternity. When the Holy Spirit comes, as we celebrated last week for Pentecost Sunday, it is not something new. The Holy Spirit has always existed. We have a new manifestation, a new understanding, a new grasp on that, but this is not a new concept for us. There are not three gods, but one God, eternally existent in three persons. We try to come up with analogies to help us understand. And I want to tell you that every analogy that we use falls short. It never completes the picture for us. You, or me, is one individual. And we might have several roles in our life. At one point in time, I was a son. My mother and dad were living, and I was their son. I am a husband. I am a father. I have three distinct roles in my life all at the same time. And that's a little bit of an analogy that maybe helps you to grasp a little bit about who God is. Although that analogy falls way short. It's not a complete analogy. Because God is much greater than, than what we can ever comprehend. Sometimes we have used the analogy of water. I remember years ago, uh, I had a, the church I was serving, we had a children's choir. We had like 25 children in this children's choir. And it happened to be Trinity Sunday. And so I was going to be preaching on the Trinity that day. And the children's choir was up and they sang and they sat down for the children's story sermon. So I come walking out from parts unknown to talk to the children about the children's story sermon. I'm carrying a cafeteria tray. And on my cafeteria tray, I have a tea kettle. I have an ice cube tray. This was a long time ago when ice cubes just didn't automatically appear in your in your freezer. I had a tea kettle, I have an ice cube tray, and I have a glass of water. And no word has been mentioned at all about the Trinity. And a little five-year-old precocious child looks at me and said, Pastor Mike, are you going to talk about the Trinity? And I said, well, yes, I am, Jason. How did you know that? He said, all three of those things have something to do with water, and yet they're all different, and they're all the same took my little tray, walked back, and said, thank you very much. Now, that analogy, of course, falls short, too. You know, in, in the tea kettle, you get steam, and so two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen can be a vapor. In the water glass, it can be a liquid. In the ice cube tray, it can be a solid. And maybe, maybe it just helps us a little bit to grasp Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe that the three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. It's not that God the Father decides he's going to create Jesus and send him to the world. Jesus is. He's not a created being. He is co-equal and co-eternal. 
there are some anticipations of the Trinity that we see in the Old Testament. In Genesis 1, the use of Elohim, which is the plural for the word God. In Genesis 1 also, let us make man in our image. In Genesis 3, is become one of us when, and when Adam and Eve had, had sinned. In, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Eloheinu, the gods, is one. And so the use of plural in referring to God is a helpful understanding for us that the concept of the Trinity is always that. Isaiah 6, 3, the Trisagion, where the cherubs sing, holy, holy, or the seraphs sing, holy, holy, holy. Why did they sing holy, holy, holy? Why not just holy, holy? Or why not just holy? Holy, holy, holy is a helpful understanding that there is three persons in the Godhead. We are not a creedal church. We say that the Bible is only our only creed or confession of faith. But the Athanasian creeds and the Nicene creed and the Apostles' creed are for us wonderful statements of faith. We give them no power or authority in and of themselves. The same as when we as a denomination have published a We Believe book and are about to publish our Here We Stand booklet. It is not any authority. It is just a summation statement for us. The Athanasian Creed has the most explicit statement of faith concerning the Trinity. We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. We believe in the Trinity. Most of us, when we pray, how do we pray? Dear Jesus, or dear Heavenly Father, did you ever pray, dear Holy Spirit? You can. It's okay. I sometimes and frequently start my prayer to God the Father, and I conclude my prayer in Jesus' name. Because Jesus tells us, when you pray to the Father, do it in my name. And so we are given that admonition or that encouragement to be able to do that. You don't need to know about John Weinbrenner at this point in time. That's part of the lecture when I do. According to Christian tradition, the mystery of the Trinity is that the relationship of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit cannot be put into words, analogies, or pictures since it goes against all rational analysis. I'm sorry, but the picture is helpful for me. Maybe it's a little helpful for you. But it is not a proof for us. God is so much more than what we can comprehend or understand. I want you to understand that the understanding and the belief in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is one of the high marks of who we are as Christian people. We are not just here to worship Jesus. That's the, he's the focus of our worship, and rightly so, because we are called Christians. And the word Christian means a small Christ. And so we are here to worship Jesus. But in worshiping Jesus, we're also worshiping the Father. And we're also worshiping the Holy Spirit who indwells us. When I walk around every day of my life, I hear the voice of God speaking to me. Now, please don't think that I'm mentally unbalanced. You already know that. I hear the voice of God speaking to me, and so do you. Every time that we read God's word and we begin to think and meditate upon it, God is speaking to us. And he's doing that through the ministry and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I've never seen the person of Jesus Christ. I don't know whether the picture that's behind me on the wall is accurate or not accurate, but I'm okay with it. Because it, it's a helpful reminder to me of who Jesus is and what he has come for and what he has done. The Lord tells us himself, no one can see the face of God and live. In fact, when Moses is up on the mountain, God hides him in the cleft of the rock and covers him with his hand when the glory of the Lord passes by. And, and, and Moses is permitted to see God's back. 
And the glory is so great that when Moses is up on that mountain, he has a glow about him. That when he comes down from that hill, he has to put a veil over his face because it's so bright that people can't look at him. God exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinity. We understand that God has made himself known in this marvelous and wonderful way. And I want you to understand that the concept of the Trinity is under attack. And it happens in some very dramatic ways and also in some very subtle ways as well. I hope that today was helpful for you. I promise not to do another PowerPoint presentation for a very long time or maybe ever. It's helpful for me when I teach to be able to do this, first of all, for the consistency of teaching this class over and over and over again, to make sure that I'm conveying the same information from one year to the next. I hope it's been helpful for you to wrestle in your mind a little bit, because we cannot fully grasp this concept of the Trinity. It is that which we wrestle with. It is that which gives us comfort. It is that which guides us and directs us. But it is marvelous. God reveals himself as Father, as Son, and as Holy Spirit. To him be all glory, power, majesty, and dominion, both now and forever. Amen.